afternoon. Croesor Canis, with the Ad Hun. Warm welcome to this event, which is part of the Legal Innovation Lab Wales' series of events for this week. Uh, this is called Technology and Access to Justice, Global Developments and Questions Over the Next Decade. Uh, I'm delighted to present the panel that we've got with you today. Uh, I feel we should put a protective ring around them because we, we've got all the, the sum of knowledge about technology and access to justice, it seems, seems to me. Uh, so uh, I'll just to introduce our panelists, uh, we have Roger Smith, OBE, who is a solicitor, a visiting professor at London South Bank University and an honorary professor at the University of Kent. Uh, Dr. Natalie Byram, who's director of research at the Legal Education Foundation, which is, um, and she's also part of the BBC Expert Women Network. And Natalie sits on the Administrative Justice Council and the Litigants in Person Group of the Civil Justice Council. Uh, Natalie has been seconded to HM Courts and Tribunal Service as an expert advisor on open data and academic engagement. And amongst other things, uh, she set out a 29 point plan for tackling digital exclusion. Uh, Dr. Sarah Nason is a senior lecturer in administrative law and jurisprudence at Bangor University, uh, a member of the editorial board of public law, an executive committee member of public law Wales, and a member of the Admi Administrative Justice Council academic panel. And Sarah was appointed as an academic fellow to uh, the Senate, the Welsh Parliament, in 2019. Uh, Karen Taylor is a senior quality manager for advice services at Rhonda Cullen Taft Citizens Advice, which is a Citizens Advice Bureau, which is extremely close to my heart, and has been working with uh, Legal Innovation Lab Wales. So we're going to start uh, with a presentation from Roger and then in turn Natalie, Sarah and Karen will be talking about their work and there'll be time for a few questions at the end. So uh, over to Roger then please. Well, thank you Richard and uh, welcome to everybody. I'm just waiting for my slides to appear on the screen which they will instantly. Um, my brief is to talk about technology uh, and access to justice over the next decade I'm doing it to an audience in Wales, so I have tried to tailor uh, what I'm saying to uh, Wales in particular, although, of course, technology is international. And much of the value of this talk, I hope, will be in bringing together global trends. Thank you for the next slide. So I've taken this slide from uh, Professor Sandifer in the States. Uh, and uh, if we could just press the next three buttons, you'll see the uh, things that come up with it, questions that come up with it. She has this rather lovely notion that uh, innovation in technology at the moment is a bit like a graveyard lemonade stand. It's kind of desirable, but is it in the right place? Has it got a future? Who will use it? Who will pay for it? Will it scale or survive? Does it change the game? This is going to be a presentation with a lot of questions because the position of technology uh, at the moment seems to me it's, it's mainly being based in a lot of projects all over the place. There isn't an overview. We're working towards getting one, which may. So what will be important in determining how technology will impact uh, on access to justice? There will be a number of factors in this and we need to look at them and depress the button so they show. Uh, so uh, before uh, honing in on technology, and there's the context of uh, in which we're taking uh, things are taking place. There's the funding that's available. There's the human infrastructure. The organisations are going to use it. There's the amount of inspiration around. And technology is just one factor. Technology itself is just one factor in how technology will be applied in innovation. Um, and the context is important. This is coming up in slightly the wrong order, but it doesn't matter. Uh, tech or, tech's impact is and is likely to continue to be profound and uneven. That is a truism. I'm sure we all agree with that. Um, so we will all be affected by technology. Uh, it's going to be massive. We don't exactly know how. In terms of government funded programs, legal aid in particular, uh, COVID has not been a good thing. Austerity has impacted on these programs, impacted since 2010, 2012, and that's gonna get worse, not better. 
So uh, the overall context is a legal aid scheme, which a civil legal aid scheme, which has been largely gutted uh, in both Wales and England uh, over the last decade. Uh, and uh, that ain't going to, there ain't going to be uh, a return to the relatively good days uh, of the first decade of the 21st century. Uh, and in the context, the position of government is important. I mean, Wales and England are, of course, one jurisdiction. Uh, but it raises the question of whether legal services, publicly funded legal services, uh, on which people in Wales have begun, or I think already to work, uh, is an area where Wales can begin to detach itself from England, indeed where it can begin to show some leadership, uh, which has been uh, rather lacking in England, and is actually rather better seen in Scotland, which 30 years ago had a very similar model to us all, but has now moved on. And if we move to the next slide, uh, promising developments. Let's uh, look at some promising developments. So we've got something specific to talk about, and that comes up in the next slide. There are a number of promising de uh, developments over the next uh, decade. One of them is the way it, which pre was happening before COVID uh, is the way that digital is improving the practice of law. Uh, and a number of reform, and a number of improvements which took place in commercial practice have sort of trickled down into the not-for-profit sector and the low, in low uh, income sector of the professional high street practice, things like uh, case management and, and so on. Uh, and of course, COVID meant that anybody, any organization had to operate remotely. So video used to be exotic, it's not. Virtual legal practice used to be exotic, it's not. Client intake programs where clients can give advanced information about their position beginning to be uh, standard. Whole things are happening digitally to, to practice, uh, which makes it smoother. And the interesting thing from that is in the next uh, point on the slide, which is that by and large, that's just improving legal practice, but actually sometimes it changes it. So video communication, you have a FaceTime with your client, doesn't really change anything, but you're an organization that deals with uh, community education and you start holding virtual seminars, like the People's Law School of British Columbia is a world leader in that. So you start to operate virtually in the community education field. And that starts to change how you work. They found that they used to go to small outposts in BC for audiences of 25. They can put on an event on, say, homelessness. They can get 300 people to it. It's changing how you might do outreach, although, in fact, it's not changing anything, basically, uh, about the practice. Then the second set of reforms, which are the next two, are really about how technology can change users' approach to uh, legal services and can develop on well-established, relatively well-established ideas like unbundling, uh, notions where a client can do more uh, themselves, uh, and behind that, the fancy name of legal empowerment. Uh, and <clears throat> what's happening there is technology can take us beyond simply giving information to someone to do it themselves we can start to allow them to draw up forms. We can start to case manage their process. Citizenship Works, which is mentioned here as a US program that helps someone doing their own uh, asylum case, immigration case through the process. So there are extensions to um, the process of legal empowerment, which are possible through uh, digitalization. Uh, and then the next two are ways in which digital is beginning to affect the process of dealing with users. So Justice Connect is an Australian organization uh, which uh, has a gateway project with a number of elements. One is a pro bono portal, but another is a referral program. And this is something which I've flagged as well, you might want something which is specifically Welsh. So you can have an automated joining up of someone who needs help uh, with uh, sources of assistance. And so rather is an area which <coughs> until now because of the dominance of, and, and um, the number of solicitors that have been around, uh, we haven't really bothered with very much, but automated referral, assisted referral, uh, may well be an area that will develop. 
Uh, and really, really excitingly, um, digitalization is allowing the com com new combinations of, cur of currently separate services. So Hello Divorce is a program in the States. It's a front for a, a solicitors, for a lawyer's firm, and it operates through a combination of DIY bits, individual bits, uh, videos. Uh, it's a new combination of separate services. Flows is a UK uh, alliance between uh, family lawyers, uh, RCJ advice, uh, and a uh, not-for-profit organization to provide services for women uh, suffering, from, uh, suffering from abuse. Uh, so digital can make these things dynamic, and we'll just pursue that in the next slide. Ah, well, we'll talk, actually, we'll pull back, we'll pull back to the context. Um, those are all things about the use of technology, but what will affect the context in which they're being used? Well, a number of, there are a number of players, a number of factors. Um, governments are the obvious one, and their funding is an obvious point. Uh, but more than that, governments have power and they have influence. And this, uh, the influence part is something which may be particularly relevant to Wales. Government can affect what happens simply by talking about things, by advocating things. Uh, and you have even the UK government, which has seen through and headed the demolition of the civil legal aid scheme, has put money into the Nesta uh, Challenge Fund for legal access. Uh, and so governments are not monolithic. Uh, they have power, they have funding, they have influence, uh, which will affect how technology is used. Um, Users uh, are, of course, key, and we will, I'm sure, in this process, in this talk, uh, this hour, talk about digital exclusion. Uh, but there's, uh, what's their expectation? What's their ease of using uh, digital sources of assistance? And I think that's a changing. What makes that a particularly difficult issue is that's a changing uh, frontier, and COVID has really played into that. For two years, people have been locked up. They've been using. Uh, digital a lot. I think it's very difficult to say who are those who are excluded and I suspect it's not quite a hard border between these two, those who can use, those who can't. Um, providers, uh, the attitude of providers will be important. There's internal digitalization, which is what I was talking about when people are, when organizations are implementing uh, case management systems and so on. And external digitalization, where they're actually digitalizing the services available to their users. There's very little of that going on, and we are behind the curve in, say, uh, putting up forms that people can uh, self-fill themselves, providing uh, information just in time to them. We're way behind the United States in relation to that massive area where we can uh, help with that. We have the whole area of uh, foundations and funders uh, in there, uh, the issues of scaling up. And the issue I just want to dwell a bit with is leadership. It's really, really difficult to lead the sector uh, in any country. There is no country that has a coherent system for leading uh, providers in the access to justice field. It's particularly difficult in England and Wales where the Legal Services Corporation, uh, Legal, Legal Services Commission uh, was abolished uh, about a decade ago. Difficult in Wales, which doesn't have its own jurisdiction, but it may be that there are voluntary measures which can be taken there. Let's move on. So that's digital exclusion and moving. To, all I want to say about that is, is a moving target. You have to keep analog going as an alternative, but uh, I believe you should, we should be exploring what we can do with digital inclusion to the maximum. Let's move to the next. Yeah, the human infrastructure is critical and the next slide will take us into that. I've tried to find some of the logo, some of the, the logos uh, and information produced by uh, people who are delivering services in the access to justice field in Wales. And this is just a random selection uh, of citizens advice bureaus, solicitors, legal aid practitioners, Speak Beauty Law Center uh, and others. It, it, it's never mind technology. It's all a bit higgledy piggledy and a bit of a mess. Uh, in terms of technology, which is expensive, we need coordination uh, and uh, we need ways of bringing people together. And if Speakeasy Law Center, just to take an example, is doing something really good, how can that be duplicated to, through citizens advice and so on and so on? Uh, 
an important point there is that technology supports organizations. It shouldn't be a threat to organizations. It doesn't replace humans. Uh, it extends like an artificial arm, uh, a third artificial arm, of what they can do. Um, and let's move next. So the point where it seems to me we are at the moment really is about moving beyond the static. Uh, our first use of the net would have been recognized by Gutenberg. It's a two dimensional use and we just put the information which we had in books on the net. What we're beginning to explore, which was the basis of uh, Web 2.0 and heaven knows what iteration we're into now, is the interactive capacity of it. And that is fantastic in terms of being able to provide people with assistance and people uh, with information through guided pathways, through interactively working through uh, issues with the program guiding them uh, through. Uh, and there are all sorts of examples of that that we can come back to, which will assist intake, will assist pro uh, problem identification. And the overall approach to technology, it, it seems to me, is we have to look for its use in specific, uh, automating specific parts of the process, not the notion that, hey, one day AI will take over uh, and the whole thing will be revolutionized. It's in the accumulation of small improvements uh, individually, which collectively will transform what we're doing and will allow things like uh, the new forms of blended services uh, which are emerging and which could well revol revolutionize how we provide services, but boy, will be a challenge for the kind of organizations behind them. Let's move on because I'm probably running out of time. Well, will technology change the game or be irrelevant uh, or just speed it up? Uh, let's think of some of the issues and some of the questions which arise in relation to that, of which the next slide will lead us on. The, there are a whole set of final co of questions uh, about uh, technology, um, which go well beyond technology itself. So question one would be, well, what technology might be relevant for us? Uh, that's what I've tried to deal with in the previous slide. But uh, as a final set of questions, here are five that to, are worth, seems to be working through. How do we evaluate uh, whether technology works? I mean, I'm running a campaign for anybody giving a grant in relation to having technology, just to give us some simple information on how many people actually are you hoping to help? How uh, and did you meet it? Did it happen? We need evaluation just at a very simple level. We can be more sophisticated about that. And Natalie, no doubt, will take us more sophisticatedly. But we need evaluation and we need the publication of evaluation uh, to help us uh, develop technology. God knows there's not enough money, so we need to be able to maximize it. There is this issue of leaderships. Um, it is does take leadership to transform an organization, to transform a whole sector. Uh, and uh, different places will have different approaches to this. I, I think this is an opening for, uh, uh, for Wales because you have a clear identity uh, over province. Um, you've begun the business of, of bringing together, legal, identifying legal services as something you can do something about. Uh, I do think it was a disaster to abolish the Legal Services Commission over both our jurisdictions, but we need leadership, otherwise nothing will happen. Um, there's a massive issue, which I'm just not gonna deal with, about court and tribunal digitalization, because that cannot be ignored. It will affect the way every, every organization, the access to justice, um, Pantheon, <laughs> CAB, Law Center, Solicitor works, uh, and raises massive problems, uh, and, but we need to take that on board and, and consider it. And that's not all. Fundamentally, technology is international. Uh, jurisdictions aren't. Uh, and how can we jump the border is a really difficult question. It's something I've just been writing about Justice Connect in Australia. How do we find ways other than serendipity of learning what's happening in Australia or the United States uh, so that we can think about it using it here, standing on their shoulders uh, to uh, use it ourselves. That, I don't know how one does that. I think it 
probably comes down to the development of international links, international organizations. But I think it's a question which technology requires us at least to ask and begin to answer. Uh, and I think finally, there's a really deep issue about how the demise, of, it's not really technology, but the demise of legal aid uh, and the growth of technology is going to change our sort of philosophical approach to legal aid and access to justice. Hitherto, for 50 years, all the time I've been practicing, the basic model has been at the end of the day, if it, you, the end of the model we work to is lawyer and client. It doesn't always happen like that. That's the model. Uh, we are away from that now. Uh, and we're going to have to find something that fills the gap and not just throw our hands up in the air and say it's, it's awful. We are going to have to develop a notion of access to justice, which includes a strong element of legal empowerment, leading to uh, representation uh, where it is required by lawyers and others. But that requires quite a degree of change of language, change of thought, uh, and change of approach, which will be quite profound in all our jurisdictions in the UK. And that is my final set of questions. So we go back to my opening slide, which is technology and access to justice, the next decade. Who knows what will happen? Just a lot of questions, really. Thank you so much for that, Roger, and giving us a global overview, but we're working out the links to, to Wales. And uh, I, I know the regional vice networks in Wales, uh, you, you were very much speaking to their priorities because uh, referral between advice agencies is a priority that comes up through every regional advice agency in Wales. And how, how do we optimise this and get, uh, get the system working as efficiently as we possibly can, We're getting cases moving between advice agencies when, when that is needed. So, so thank you very much. So be time for questions in the end. Uh, but now, could I ask please Natalie to talk for about 10 minutes on, on the work you've been doing in sort of the, the digital access to justice space, please. Oh, well, it's always um, a delight and a privilege to follow Roger. And if anyone knows what's going to happen in the next 10 years, I would have assumed that it would be him at this point. So if he doesn't know, I think we're all in trouble. Um, so I thank you for the kind introduction and for having me here um, to speak today. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Director of Research at the Legal Education Foundation. For those of you who aren't aware of us, we're an independent grant making trust and we fund frontline organisations, mostly not for profit agencies, working to support people to access the justice system. So what I wanted to talk to you about today, um, most relevantly for our discussion, um, is between 2018 and 2020, I was seconded to the UK government as expert advisor on open data. And this secondment took place in the context of the ongoing £1 billion programme of court reform that aims to modernise the justice system by closing physical courts and replacing them with digital end-to-end -end systems. Um, in 2019, the Legal Education Foundation published our report, Digital Justice, which set out 29 recommendations for improving the quality and accessibility of the data that's held by the courts. Um, most of these recommendations have been accepted, but we're still working hard to ensure that um, implementation takes place. So what did um, we find during our time um, sort of embedded within the court service? Well, really, what we uncovered was poor quality data, a lack of information that would enable you to link um, individuals to the outcomes they secure through the justice system, a lack of data asset registers, and privatised arrangements that place key data sets that could be of real benefit to researchers and the advice agency behind paywalls. The digital transformation of the courts offers the opportunity to both fundamentally, I'm so sorry, my dog has a lot to say about these issues, <laughs> clearly in the background, very passionate about digital courts. <laughs> so digital transformation offers the opportunity to both fundamentally rethink the data collected on the operation of the justice system and address systemic deficiencies in access to primary legal information. So that by that, I mean things like judgments and information about courts and court users. It's an opportunity for innovation in the design and delivery of legal services. 
um, the promise of more and better data available in accessible formats has forced conversations around ownership and governance that speak to broader constitutional tensions. At present, these are being managed through the creation of a shadow senior data governance panel, which brings together for the first time the judiciary and the MOJ to have a conversation about what the rules and frameworks should be in place to govern access to that data. So really, the move towards court digitization is, as Roger and others know, it's a, it's a global trend. It presents new opportunities, but it also creates new challenges for access to justice. So I guess what I wanted to talk about today is how do we ensure that this promise of new and better data properly governed benefits access to justice and supports those people who need the protection of the justice system the most? Well, firstly, I think we need to improve the way we articulate the harm that's caused by existing arrangements and work with communities to build a public mandate for a new system. The fact remains that if you spoke to the majority of community law centres that left funds, issues around justice data would be the bottom of their priorities. However, research in the US conducted by Data and Society has revealed the real and immediate harm that arrangements that privilege access to data for commercial entities create for vulnerable clients in the housing courts. The data flows through and from the justice system, at least in England and Wales, are poorly codified and understood. This makes it really difficult to shine a light on the harms that are created and build a case for change. Um, we need to do more to emphasise and help people to understand existing arrangements, the way in which they privilege access by certain actors, mostly those with access to resources, and the impact that this has. In the UK, in health data, awareness raising and consultation with patients about attitudes to health data being accessed by private companies on a preferential basis has been used to create the policy space for action. And I think we all saw that if you were following on Twitter, um, the reaction to the government's proposed GPGDR programme. Funders and academics need to invest in research and engagement into public attitudes towards existing arrangements for accessing court data, focusing particularly on the views and experiences of marginalised communities. Secondly, I think what we need to do is to stop privileging the needs of private companies and elite actors in our discussions around arrangements for accessing data. In England and Wales, much of the attention and interest in this space, at least on the government side, is driven by a desire to service the needs of law tech, which is a nebulously defined field of, of organisations. This has led to an undue focus on asking the state to create machine readable data sets which can be mined to reduce the cost that's incurred by for profit entities at the expense of prioritising that foundational work which might tackle the access to justice gap. Access arrangements for data should be based not on who's requesting it, but on the purpose for which access is sought and access to court data for projects that can demonstrate can be demonstrated to support equal access to the justice system, not exacerbate existing inequalities of power need to be prioritized. Thirdly, I think as a research community, we need to invest in empirical research to understand the risks posed by improving access to court data. Members of the judiciary in England and Wales have raised concerns about the impact of making more data available on judicial independence and things like judicial doxing, targeting of judges for the decisions that they make in individual cases and variance that occurs between them. We need to be able to robustly quantify which of the risks identified are real and immediate and which are theoretical and illusory. There's inadequate research exploring the impact of open data on judicial behaviour, so does having more data available in the public sphere make it more likely that judges are pressured to decide cases in a particular way or not? Um, there's also inadequate research to look at what action might be more effective than restricting access to data to, um, to address these concerns. And I firmly have the view that we need to think about how do we regulate use rather than restricting access to data that we all need to have access to to understand at a basic level how justice is being applied in this country. Fourthly, I think we need to do better to capture more evidence on the benefits of improving access to court data and making it more available more openly. This is a problem that's bedeviled the open data movement as a whole. Um, so we need to identify um, research priorities with underserved communities to ensure that the research and the innovation that's carried out on the basis of these data sets addresses real world problems. We need to work with judges and court administrators to develop projects that address their issues and concerns so that we can really build a cycle where everyone understands and benefits from the value that data can provide. Fifthly, and really importantly, I think there's urgent work that we need to do to fix the ecosystem. 
to regulate law tech, to capture better data on what works, what do any of these products deliver in terms of outcomes for the people that use them. We need to curate and document the data sets that are being used for techniques such as natural language processing to make sure that they're not entrenching biases that we know are already captured in that data. And we need to support organizations working at the front line in the access to justice space to capture the benefits of increased access to data and technology. In 2019, the UK government made £22.7 million available to support digital innovation in legal services. Less than 1.5% of that funding was awarded to organisations working in the areas of law funded by legal aid. If we're not careful, what we're going to do is develop a two-tier system whereby organisations that have the capacity to engage with and secure additional funding for digitisation are given an advantage that exacerbates existing inequalities of power. And to this end, TLEF are developing a programme work, of work which is led by sector expert Tracy Guyantang, who came from Datakind, um, to work with community organisations to improve the quality and usability of their data, to help them harness the data that they hold to improve their services and to understand need. Um, we also need to work to address imbalances of power between not-for-profit companies and private organisations who offer help to develop products in return for access to their data. I think one of the things that's really hard for frontline organisations is to realise is that the extreme value that the data that they hold on their clients has for private companies. And so we need to do more to support frontline agencies to become informed and empower consumers, consumers of tech. That's really um, all I had to say for now, but I'm really looking forward to the discussion later and really happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie. As someone who's director of a vice agency in Wales, so much of what you were saying again was resonating with me. We have this very ambitious piece of legislation, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which sets seven and very ambitious goals. Uh, and I feel that the data is going to be so important in terms of fulfilling that goal. And uh, things like health justice partnerships, greater collaboration, greater partnerships, how data flows, which is obviously a very serious issue through confidentiality, data protection, but how we can get data flowing between the advice sector and the health sector would, would be something I'd be interested in picking up with you later. So, yes. Thank you very much for that. So if I could now call on please uh, uh, Sarah, Dr. Sarah Nason, who's the most preeminent researcher into administrative justice in Wales. Uh, so knows a lot about specific Welsh law uh, and enforcing and accessing rights. And I know has been doing interesting work in the technology space. So over to you, please, Sarah. Thanks very much, um, Richard. So I feel, um, I think I'm going to be moving a bit maybe more from the global to the to the local, because I'm going to be focusing on um, two particular projects that, that we've been working on in Wales. But I think that the issues that have, ra have been raised so far, and particularly the questions Roger mentioned uh, around scalability, sustainability, funding, and also what, what Natalie has said about measuring outcomes are pretty equally very, very important to the projects that, that we've been doing. So um, the first project is about administrative justice in Wales. Um, it was a project that was funded by the Nuffield Foundation. Uh, it came about because there was a committee for administrative justice and tribunals in Wales that I think recognised um, and re recommended research really to map administrative justice in Wales to try and get to grips with whether there are gaps in the system, so difficulties, areas where people have difficulties seeking redress, overlaps where there are multiple routes to, to redress where it's quite difficult for people to navigate those and understand them and also um, efficiency and, and accessibility of the system and, and I should say for, for, for those that don't know that administrative justice is um, really the whole system of public administrative law that governs public body decision making how people can seek redress and also how public bodies can learn and improve and the Commission on Justice in Wales said that this is the area of the, the justice system in Wales that has the largest impact on people in Wales. And actually significant elements of it are already devolved. So that's where the, the interest in that comes from. Um, much of our research was, was really traditional socio-legal research in the sense that we were collecting together information about Welsh law, particularly in the areas of social housing and homelessness and education with um, information about policy, previous research, existing data and, and so on. And also having workshops with policymakers, 
with practitioners, advice services, providers, first instance decision makers in the administrative justice sector and, and so on. And so in that, uh, through that research, we produced a number of reports, pathways to justice in, in Wales that are available on the Nuffield Foundation's website. But one of the things that occurred to me in thinking about this is we were talking about mapping um, administrative justice is a, a kind of notoriously complex area in terms of how pathways to justice have developed piecemeal ad hoc over time. We started to think about how can we actually present some of these maps and the aim really was to think about how we could um, present these maps in the workshops with the professionals. And I'd come across some of the, the previous projects in other jurisdictions, particularly using network analysis of law and thinking about uh, legal connections as, as kind of being nodes and edges, which are sort of pathways between these nodes and whether we could represent some elements of the administrative justice system in, in that way. So I've been particularly looking at work that was done in New Zealand, some work that was done in the United States. But when you move from the global to the local, I realized I had a professor of visualization in my own institution who I'd never spoken to before. And so what we ended up was um, co-producing a prototype tool for mapping uh, pathways to administrative justice. And I have to say it is, it is at this stage a prototype. So I think what we've produced is a, um, a kind of proof of concept of how you map administrative justice. And we've got some examples of that. One is in education, and one is in social housing and homelessness, but we think in terms of scalability that it's something that could apply outside of, of, of Wales and also to various different areas of administrative justice. So you know, we started off with an idea of perhaps we could have this map as a zoomable interface and we could go and look at some of the bodies in the administrative justice system in Wales. So people like local authorities, the public services ombudsman, the administrative court and, and so on. Um, and then it was a Welsh government official who in one of our workshops said, wouldn't it be great if you could also give people a map in a sense of a guide through the system. So some of the guided pathways um, like the flows project actually that we heard a bit about. So this was the, these were our initial designs and the design that we've sort of focused on in the end was this idea of having a context view and a focus view. So your context view is, is like your London tube map of the Welsh administrative justice system in a particular area. And the focus view is if you like your transport for London journey planner that shows you through, through the system. So I'm just going to talk you through a little bit about that through um, through an example, but like I say, it's 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 still in development. The first question I tend to get when I present this is, um, can you give us the um, the web link so that we can go and start using it? And it's not at that stage yet, but obviously we would like it to be uh, eventually. But we did it did work very effectively as a tool that we used in our own workshops with professionals, helping them to understand the the system. So the prototype is called Artemis. It's after a, a famous Welsh judge called Sir Thomas Artemis Jones. I might well leave you to, to look up why, he, why he's famous. The first thing that you see when you go into this, um, into this tool will be that you get to describe the issue that you're facing. And this worked example is, is to do with education. So let's say somebody's child is excluded from school. And it's the, the kind of technology where it, it learns from what you write in this keyword search. So it, it, can, um, it, it can learn to understand the kind of ways that people might explain their problems. And I should say for, for us, we think that this is a tool that would probably be of most benefit to advisors themselves rather than the general public. So it's something that an advisor could, could use and sort of walk a client through. And it could also be a public legal education tool at some stage, but like I say, it's still, in development. So we imagine somebody um, is um, facing an issue of exclusion. We show them that the a body that's really important in this system is the is the head teachers. We give them a legal disclaimer. Um, if you're looking closely, you'll see this is still in development because that's that's still in, in Latin, but that would be a disclaimer to say our aim is not to provide legal advice, it's to provide information. Um, the user starts their journey, they can learn about who the head teachers are and what their role is in the administrative justice system, making decisions about children, they can click to learn more, they get additional information, they can um, click to learn more and go to the legislation itself and to look at the guidance. And then we find that there is a decision point available for that individual and so you can see the kind of context map on one hand maps onto the pathway on the other. 
and they can decide either to make representations to the next body in the system, which is the, the school governors, or not to make representations. And then before they make representations, they can learn a little bit about what that involves. Um, we, we've heard about kind of referrals, and I think this is a, this is a really important thing for, for us. Is this, this, isn't, this is not a tool that's designed to give advice, but it can show people where they can go to, to get advice. And so it, it links into um, the advice providers here, for example, Snap Cymru or the Children's Commissioner. We take our next step, it's to the governing body discipline committee, so we decide to make representations and we find that there are certain decisions that the governors themselves can make. And again, we can see where our onward appeal route from the governor's decision would be if that's where we want to go. So we might want to go, for example, to an exclusion to appeal panel, which is the next um, stage if you want to carry on that journey. And again, you can learn more about the, um, the exclusions appeal panel, the powers they have, and the decisions that they might make. And so for example, they can uphold the decision to exclude. And in this example pathway, imagine that they have upheld the decision to exclude. We then show the user what are their options. And importantly, an option is to accept the decision of the appeal at body and you know, not to go any further. But there is a potential, and this is sort of showing some of the complexities of the administrative justice system, to complain to an ombudsman about administration of the appeals process, but there's also a potential to seek judicial review of the legality. Um, and we did spend a lot of time talking to the ombudsman about the appropriate wording to put in here to, to explain what an ombudsman does versus what judicial review is. Um, we imagine in this example that our person has decided to seek judicial review. Um, it, again, it's not quite finished, so you can see this is just Latin, but the point of the, the kind of big red banner there is to say, don't go near legal action without taking legal advice. And, and at this point to be able to give people links um, to the legal advice that's available. Um, for us, the, the prototype has always been designed on the basis that it's a, a, a bilingual um, bilingual application. So this is just the, the same slide that I've just shown, but this is the version can write. And what the user can do is actually download their journey. So they've got a kind of recording of, of the journey that, they, that they've been on. Um, so this is, I suppose it's just an example of a number of the things that were being discussed in, in terms of pathways, in terms of there's potential um, for, for referral, but it's a prototype and there are questions for us to answer around scalability and sustainability and future funding is something that we hope to take forward with, uh, with partners um, in, in the future. And I, but I think particularly because you know we were doing a project anyway that was about mapping the Welsh system of administrative justice system of administrative justice. So we collected all the legal information and, and data um, that needs to be kept up to date if this is going to be a useful application. Um, and the, the, so there, there are questions around whether potentially even some of that collection of the legal data that goes into the map could itself be uh, automated. So I hope you found that example interesting and I'll just very briefly talk about the other project that I've been involved in. This is the um, North and Mid Wales Law Clinic. It started last autumn as a virtual law clinic. So North Wales has not traditionally had a law clinic, Bangor University Law School hasn't had a law clinic. This clinic was set up through the Ministry of Justice, the UK Ministry of Justice Litigant in Person Support Programme funding. The funding primarily goes to citizens advice and in particular the lead partners in Asmon and Denby and that enables them to expand their capacity and their specialist legal support capacity in casework and administration and infrastructure so things like laptops and mobile phones. It means that they're able to offer our students an incredible virtual um, training program for them to be generalist caseworkers and eventually specialist legal support caseworkers. They've done all their training online, they've done all their volunteering online because this project began during the, the pandemic. And it's been a brilliant opportunity for the students to get involved. We, you know, we think it's enhanced access to justice in North Wales, but obviously we have a lot of evaluation to do. But my point would be that you know the technology hasn't been the magic bullet because the technology has enabled us to do something something great but it's the ministry of justice funding without that this project wouldn't have existed in the first place so 
Sorry, Richard, I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. Classic mistake. Sorry about that. I was just saying that Sarah was uh, too modest to say that you're the clinical lead at uh, Bangor Law School and you've ju just won the Access to Justice Foundation Prize and you're at the uh, uh, Attorney General and Law Works uh, Student Pro Bono Award. So, so you, you work making a big impact very quickly and it's, it's great to see uh, another thriving university law clinic in Wales coming onto the scene. That, that, that's brilliant. So um, if I could uh, call on Karen then, please, who's actually been working with the Legal Innovation Lab Wales. And many, many years ago, I was a volunteer at Karen's Citizens Advice Bureau. And what, what has been concerning me um, during the pandemic, in the sense we, we've had a very successful transfer over to sort of virtual advice sectors. Uh, but how do we help with the digital excluded? We, we kind of, we've just been so relieved to keep our services going during the pandemic. But um, before we get on to that, could you tell us about the work you've been doing with the Legal Innovation Lab Wales, please, Karen? Yeah, of course, no problem. My name's Karen Taylor, and I'm the Senior Advice Services Manager for Rhonda Penn and Taft Citizens Advice. Um, we've been working with the Legal Innovation Lab probably since the pandemic started, looking at kind of different ways we can reach clients, ensure that we um, ha have got that digital element to the, to the work that we've been doing. Um, we've been drawing on their expertise, um, working with the team to look at all different avenues in which we can kind of just increase our, our legal tech and the digital tech for our clients really. Um, the pandemic has probably thrown us into a situation where we've had to look at this in much more detail. Um, some of the things that we've been working on locally within Rhonda Penn and Taft, so we've got um, what we call our virtual drop-in service. So um, prior to COVID, we had around 21 outreach locations. Obviously, due to COVID, we had to close them down. Um, so we've been, we've been working on a virtual drop-in service using video technology where clients can just drop in. Um, access and, and kind of infrastructure in the local area can be difficult to get clients um, kind of access and services. And, and the drop-in services were a, a really good way where people could access advice. So we've taken them out online now. So we run two online drop-in sessions, which clients are engaging with. Um, but again, you know, we understand there are clients out there that aren't able to access this provision um, that haven't got access to the internet, don't have access to smartphones, don't have access to a laptop. Um, so it's really important that we kind of diversify that. We've been also um, working with online signing um, material, so getting our sort of financial statements and, and third party authorizations out via um, signable software um, so people can sign that online um, rather than clients having to bring things into us. So looking just to diversify and, and build in some legal tech into our sort of day-to-day -day, um, operations really. It's really interesting that everyone's been talking about an online referral system. Um, we, we work with an online referral system across the networks within, within Wales and across the networks for citizens advice. We have an online referral net system which allows us to refer across agencies that's worked really, really well during the pandemic. Um, lots of people out there find it difficult to navigate the system now. What agencies are open? What agencies can I attend? Can I do this face to face? Um, but the online referral portal has enabled us to um, seamlessly transfer clients across a number of agencies within Wales. Um, it's really worked really, really well in um, Rotherham and Taff and Cwm Taff Morganog, where we've been bringing agencies on to this refer referral portal. We've recently brought on some pro bono solicitors from Rotherham and Taff. Um, they previously used to come into the office and run a pro bono clinic. That's not available to them at the moment, but we have a large number of clients that need to access this type of advice. So we've been working really closely with them um, and they're actually on our refer net system. So one of the a private law company on there, we're able to make those referrals to them. And similarly, they can make those referrals to us as well. Um, but, you know, drawing back then to the, the, the legal innovation, it, it's been really great to have that expertise in Wales, to be able to run ideas past them. It's a massive expertise that we haven't got within our local office. You know, we, we think we know what we want and, and how legal tech could work for us, but having that resource in, in Swansea Union has been really good for us to be able to run things past. Is this a good idea? Is it not a good idea? And it's been really great to have that expertise um, and, that, and to give us confidence that tech can work within our organisation. We can 
kind of branch out, we can look at different, um, think outside the box and think of different ways to engage with clients, but also in the back of our minds continuously, we're always working with those clients that can't access us, you know, and, and um, in rather kind of tough, we are moving back to in-person advice, but with a blended approach, we won't lose our virtual drop-ins, we won't lose our telephone advice, the ReferNet platform is here to stay, um, so it's kind of incorporating all those now going forward to ensure that we try to cover all, all bases, really. Thank you so much, Karen, and it kind of reinforced my own view about sort of after the pandemic a sort of blended blended view uh, blended approach might be best uh i would just wonder if any participants would like to ask questions if you could uh hit the raise hand button please if you want to ask a question and while you're thinking of formulating a question i'm afraid i'm going <laughs> to take advantage of uh, sharing the situation there's so, so many i've got so many questions actually so um uh, i am um, I, I mean, there's a lot of talk of referral, and um, I'm chair of the steering group for Swansea Youth Portal Talbot Regional Advice Network. Uh, and I, I guess the first question is what a lot of advice agencies say is they want a tremendous degree of sophistication from apps in terms of what they could use for referral. So they'd like to know what capacity is that day or that week or whatever, uh, what is expected of them in terms of briefing materials they need to provide. Uh, what are expectations of them in terms of data protection consents? Um, what, what are expectations of them in terms of do they need to provide interpretation facilities? So a very, very high degree of sophistication. So I guess I'll just put this out to any panelist, really. Is, is that sort of feasible at this moment in time, that, that degree of sophistication? Yes. Uh, and it's present uh, around the world in a number of organisations, largely, to my knowledge, uh, within the pro bono field. So I referred to this Australian organisation, Justice Connect. There are other similar organisations in the United States which have automated assisted ways of referring someone who comes and says, I, I have a problem. I think I should be entitled to, I may be entitled to pro bono assistance. That's one part of it. And then down the other end are all the issues, Richard, you're raising, you know, what you have to do, when are the hours open, how does it happen, blah, 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 and matching them up. Uh, and uh, I thought it was really interesting that that sort of thing, the bare bones of that happened now. And I guess the process, having set it up, um, those running it will see from their own experience of it, how it can be improved potentially uh, and that's the way it'll happen. It'll be the sort of gradual improvement of bits of it, um, which will be the way forward. And I think there are a number of examples. I mean, if you set yourself the task of finding out what was similar around the world, I think within 10 minutes and a good couple of fingers, uh, you could pick up a whole load of um, examples around on the net. I actually think I actually think it's a bit more complicated. Um, firstly, because underpinning what you would need in order to take in order to make that work is for to be able to input in real time the capacity at individual law centres. And actually, most of the organisations we work with are nowhere near the ability to be able to do that. What we're talking about is having real time data on like waiting times. The other point about replicate dropping ideas from the US into our system is they have no a very different concept of data protection and a much more the kind of liberal attitude to um, privacy concerns. So I think one of the things that um, it's very easy to think about um, tech as a panacea and everyone jumps to focusing on the sort of tech solutions when actually a lot of the foundational work that's underneath is is really missing and that's all about just improving the quality of the data that you have on which clients are you seeing where are they coming from and then once you've got that data you can then move to a position where you're thinking about building kind of um more responsive tech solutions on top of that but i think there's a lot more work that foundations like left and others need to do in terms of what people in data refer to as like fixing the plumbing, like basically putting in place those systems that enable you to leverage things like smart referral mechanisms. Thank you. I think Karen wants to come in. 
Yeah, I just wanted to come in around kind of self-referral. We talk around agencies making referrals in for people, but sometimes or something in the future, maybe looking at clients making a self-referral in for themselves or following a process a little bit like what Dr. Sarah showed us, but then actually making that referral or making a contact with, with an organisation. I think from our perspective, it, it, within Wales, Referna is working well. It is in the complex system. Um, it, it, it doesn't require, you know, to know about capacity it probably it requires to know about kind of turnaround times for referrals but i think it is is doable um and i think it is about you know working with those clients and the public to understand what do they want if they're clicking a couple of buttons and it says okay you need to move to the next stage to contact you know snap company for example how do they do that seamlessly how can they um you know get to where they need to be as, as, as seamless as possible um so i think you know something around self-referral um for clients in the future would be would be useful or knowing a little bit more about that you know thank you so much um uh, unless anyone any of the uh, oh richard uh richard jones from law society wales office would, would like to ask a question so richard go ahead Um, I can't hear Richard. I don't know if my colleague Ben can help. Oh. Okay, thank you for that. I've got to say, really enjoyed that presentation. I think um, Sarah, Karen, the work that's been done is, is brilliant. What I see this, and as if we can get over that um, the confidentiality, it is that sharing of resources, because there is so much in Wales. There is there is so much good work going on in this field but it's only by working together from one central hub and by, and by sharing that work out and also by individual um, advice centres specialising in, in certain areas. Now, I know that Aberyst with University are looking at veterans. Um, I was in a meeting last week with the Indian High Commissioner and they'd be very keen to do some work with somebody in Wales around um, females from the South Asian community who may be immersed in, 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 in that community and, and need advice. So I, I think it's very much that this, this artificial intelligence and, and this work can absolutely work in this field, but it is only by all agencies kind of working together. Uh, and I think that's what really excites me about it. Thank you very much, Richard. Do any panelists want to respond to Richard's comments? I, I just just to thank the Legal Innovation Lab Wales itself, actually, because I think you know from from as as he's mentioned, I think that th this is this is a great hub, you, you know, to start to start doing these things, to start making these connections, to to start having this um this way of sharing the the work that that we're all doing, and to start hopefully collaborating more on future projects and things. So I think the the Legal Innovation Lab is such a is such a great resource to have for that. Yes. And Richard touched on something I know you used to. Richard knows about this uh, uh, this frustration of mine from my, my time on the Law Society Wales Committee uh, that sometimes the sisters profession are seen as something separate from the advice sector, uh, and and sometimes they're performing a service that the rest of the advice sector uh, cannot perform, and particularly with, with casework. And so I think the more the more we can integrate the advice sector with the sisters profession. Um, uh, particularly the legal aid part of the, the solicitor's profession, I think would be to the best. I mean, I, I can follow on from Richard a bit, unless, unless any participant wants to come in. I'll just pause for a second. Um, but what, what I'm finding, a, a number of organisations are developing apps. We've heard about Refernet. Um, uh, and uh, I, I know in, in Swansea, a homeless charity is developing a referral app. We've got DELIS, which is the, the Welsh Government's uh, database of advice agencies. Uh, I do, are any panellists aware of how we, the best way, the optimum way we can get these different apps speaking to one another? Because I don't have the, the technical background to, to know about these things. I was just wondering if the, any of the panellists do. Sorry, again, on mute. Um, the Stanford Legal Design Lab has done a lot of work on um, what we need to do in order to build. And I know Roger's been heavily in touch with Margaret Hagen, who leads that work, thinking about how we can create APIs that enable different sort of apps to 
communicate um, with each other and how we can think about developing common blueprints for building technology so that we're all able to like build on each other and developing apps in the open. I think um, one of the one of the of course the hugely beneficial things that you have in Wales that's pretty unique actually across um, the UK and internationally is um, the sale data bank and that offers you the opportunity to really particularly as um, I know that the Ministry of Justice is um, about to transfer data on the family courts into cell, which should mean for the first time you will have the ability to identify pathways into the family justice system and downstream outcomes from people leaving the family justice system. And that gives you the opportunity to think really creatively about how you meet need at an earlier stage. And I think there's huge amounts of kind of innovation and really strategic thinking that having big pieces of, of important like data infrastructure there can really help you with and the question that you alluded to Richard um, about health justice partnerships and how do you manage how do you sort of share information between legal and health services it feels like in Wales you have a lot of the technology and the expertise um, at Swansea that would enable you to be able to to do that so I think it's it's really really exciting. Thank you. Does anyone else want to? If I could just come in on your question, Richard. I doubt whether the answer is an app. <laughs> uh, and so I think the, what I was trying to say in my talk, the question is going to be, how can you, for Wales, uh, develop an integrated um, referral system? Uh, and I take Natalie's point about um, confidentiality and um, the need for the, the consequent need in a way to for organizations to look at their own data before you get it but I, I don't know what the system is but i bet if you got the organizations who could see a benefit from the referral and that presumably is most of the organizations uh, here in wales to sit around a table and begin to design the process by which they might that's margaret hagan's design i mean the, the core thing about margaret hagan's design thing is get people together with a bunch of sticky notes and some jolly little uh, squiggly diagrams linking everything together, get it visual uh, and uh, move forward. And so I doubt whether the answer is an app. Uh, that may be a consequence of the uh, decision. Um, the answer will be a process where the organizations begin with a problem. You got a rudimentary referral system. Uh, how could you think of improving it? You know, under what categories would people, could, could it be updated weekly with information from uh, all the organizations as to their waiting times and so on? Could you automate that process? Could, each, could all, some of the organizations automate that? Um, what processes might work in relation to that? It's gonna come down to a meeting, a room, Red Bull pizzas and sticky notes which might be virtual or not. Right, I think, oh, something's in the Q&A. Uh, yes, which in the Q&A box, the challenge is having an effective gatekeeper system. So uh, that's certainly correct. So uh, unless there's another participant who wants to ask a question, um, uh, as time is sadly up, uh, may I thank our panelists very much. Karen, Sarah, Natalie and Roger, thank you so much for such such an inter interesting presentations and uh, I feel really helped to move the the agenda on. I, I feel equipped. I've got a meeting the Swansea Neath Talbot Regional Vice Network tomorrow. I, I feel equipped to, to go into it following this discussion today. Um, and, and that's thanks to the, this, this remarkable gathering of expertise that we've had here. And thank you so much. And and from Roger and Natalie picking up the links in particular for how this might relate to us here, here in Wales. We're, we're very grateful to you all. So so thank you very much. Diolch o'Gallan, heartfelt thanks, and, and goodbye.